architecture to testbed. Uh, today we, we will learn some novel architectures uh, for entrance and also future possibilities for deploying such solutions for future in, uh, research and experimentation. Uh, we'll have three speakers today. Uh, two of them are from, from Brazil. So we'll see how the, the testbed infrastructure, building infrastructure, experimenting uh, on top of this infrastructure is progressing in Brazil. We'll, we'll also have a speaker from uh, UK, uh, so we'll learn how, how the Janet plans the, uh, the evolution of the testbed test facilities, uh, dark fiber infrastructure. So I would like to introduce the first speaker uh, from Brazil, Yara Machado. She's assistant director at RNP for advanced internet. She coordinates working groups related to advanced application projects. She has been working for more than 19 years in Brazilian telecommunication company, Embratel, as management system architecture. So please, uh, you are welcome. Floor is yours, uh, presentation, building an infrastructure for experimentation between Brazil and Europe. Thank you. <coughs> Good morning. Uh, my presentation is uh, about a project called Fiber. And uh, the Fiber project is the first ICT <coughs> Brazilian Europe coordinating call in 2011. Its coordinating call is a, a funding, a joint funding from Brazilian side and the European side. And the Fiber project again, funding, and one of this was Fiber. Future Internet Experimental Facility. Uh, future Internet today is, uh, has no, everybody knows that the current Internet has many limitations and have some problem to future development. So uh, research in Future Internet, you have to discuss new architectures, how you develop the Internet. And uh, to do that, you need to evaluate some alternative proposal and uh, and new architecture. And the idea of the, the future internet research is creating an environment for large scale uh, that can experiment these, these ideas. And uh, this kind of the environment needs some coexisting with the network traffic of the production <clears throat> and should be flexible, flexible and programmable, software defined network. And uh, the idea that research can quickly deploy new ideas, new activities, and research. So uh, the fiber objective is create a space, a common space between Europe and Brazil, the, that the future internet experimental research. So the idea create a network infrastructure and distributes application, it building an operation. Um, Test bed, but a federated test bed. And so the fiber born in as a federated test bed. And uh, so the project was divided in some working package. The heavy one working package that's the project manager. Two working packages one WP2, I'm the coordinator of the WP2, and WP3. The idea that the building the operation of the Brazilian facility. For us, uh, is the building from the scratch. And, uh, and at the European side, you have some facilities deploying. The idea is um, enhances this facility. And uh, I have another working pack, that's the federation. Because you have a lot of the island, you need to federation these islands. The WP5 development some use case, because you have to, to show how you use this test bed and the WP6 dissemination collaboration. Here's a um, consortium structure, I pass first. So here's important. <clears throat> now is a map of the university and the research and education network, research and development centers, and some uh, industry partners. Uh, here you can see uh, the, oops, uh, the, the, the institution in Brazil, and uh, the other side in Europe. You have some university, research center, and uh, oops, a network is a private, is a research center also. And here you have university, Ayn Rain, that's RNP. 
and the research center, the CPKG. And to connect to this test bed, you have two, two connections. One use uh, one from, I'm sorry, <laughs> one from University of Bristol and uh, Sao Paulo, and another from Ichuquet to Sao Paulo. I'll show more detail about this. And the uh, international connection is uh, another challenge because you need pass for many domains, and the, to connect to this, this infrastructure uses some domains, Clara, Jean, Rigiri, Sesca, and the other side is going to Ampef, Internet to Jean, Janet, Bristol. Uh, here's more detail about the connection. So you use um, the Ampef uh, in, uh, in Miami and go until mainland and connect to Jean to go to Janet. And here in Brazil, you connect uh, also and São Paulo to Rede Clara, Jean, and a Rede is Ichuquet. Um, I show some pictures about what is the island, because it, which in, uh, institution deploy an island that from the fiber project. So the Ichuquet island, <coughs> you have some equipment like servers, uh, open flow suites, you use pronto suites here, and uh, you have some optical DWDM equipment because you have some um, GM PLS projects and connect to Regiris and uh, University of Bristol and Ophelia. And have some wireless network also. And each way each, you have some, it's more focused in wireless network and they use the, the wireless of the orbit nodes and some open flow suites and the, the servers. At Bristol, you have some other resource and some, you can see some optical resource also, and VPN and uh, equipment to deploy virtual machine. At Brazil, you have some 10 islands. And uh, because you are the great the project from the scratch, you define some homogeneous island. So all island receive a, a set of the equipment that creates a, what's called island Brazilian island. So we use the NetFPJ server, NetFPJ on as an open flow resource, um, a server because you have some virtual machine and uh, deploy some software here and pronto suites, and uh, some equipment to connect with the RP and the wireless network also. And they uh, use some equipment from a Brazilian company called Datacom, and uh, support the open flow this equipment and connect with the, the test beds. Uh, here's um, some picture from the one island in the University of the Goiás. Oh, here is another hack in Universidade de São Carlos, Universidade de Pernambuco. So you have some work to deploy all this infrastructure. Uh, and you see the, uh, the architectural review. So you connect uh, the at university in each university, connect to the point of presence of the RNP, and uh, you have some resources in each island. The idea that you use more than one control framework because the island is heterogeneous. Have some wireless resource and server resource and the open flow resource. And you decide for use a three kind of the control frameworks. And they use Ophelia control frameworks, OMF, Protegin. I, I will explain more in details. And the GMPLS, they what WGN. And uh, the idea that connects all islands and federate is island because the, the idea that the, the user, the end user can connect, go to the portal and uh, select which research that one. But you use all these control frameworks. I explain more detail how you do that. Uh, here is an architectural review. 
use three control frameworks, like I said. Ophelia control frameworks is uh, created in the context of the Ophelia test bed projects, is an ICT project also, and uh, is an open flow controller. And uh, is use the SFA uh, architecture, that's the similar used in, in Gini project in the United States. OMF is a framework uh, focused on controlling um, wireless equipment. And uh, it's based in the XMEPP and Ruby language, and it has an OML um, language to describe the, your experiment and can use it for instrument of the wireless network. And use the Protogene because in Sao Paulo you have a cluster MLAB and to decide also include Protogene in the test bed. Okay, so it's a, the fiber proposal is you have a, a fiber portal based in my slice that's a tools that federates control framework, it's a SFA basis. And in each island, you have more than one control framework. You can run OMF, OCF, Protogene. And they have a lot of a set of research that it is control framework, control this, this control order. And for the, the user, and it ask you for the research, select the, the research that you want, and uh, here, all these instrumentation controlled by these control applications. And create for the end user uh, what you call user-defined network. And create your network, to our network, and, uh, and deploy the software in the machine, and uh, have some topology, and can code experiment with this environment. Yeah. And another challenge it was create an infrastructure, a substrate infrastructure to create the data plan. And uh, so you create the idea that you have a fiber network. That's a network on top of the production network. And the phase zero, you start to connect with a VPN. It's more easy. And uh, the, uh, the idea is connect all the islands. So you create um, a VPN, and uh, in Nokia you have a VPN server and connect it on top of the level three. But the, the, the connectivity is based in level two of the network, and you have a data plan and a control plan separated. And uh, you call the fiber net, that's the SDN network based in the open flow and this network's programmability, virtualization, and separate the data and control plan. Here is the idea, you create some tunnels. You have the, um, the production network inside of, you have tunnel for the fiber. Inside, oops, in fiber side, side fiber, I have the island tunnels. <laughs> and so it's a, a lot of the abstraction layer. Uh, here is a picture that shows how can you connect all in, in which point of presence of RNP. You have a equipment that the fiber net, this is the backbone of the fiber net, and the, at, at, at each island, you have another equipment that connects with. So you create a, a network here for the experimenters. Uh, for the user, user don't know what the, the details of this network, because for the user, the network is a, <clears throat> a resource that can control. So the, resource, the, the, net, the user creates the topology and asks for the, the test bed to create this topology for, for him. And uh, he uses the OCF to configure all the, vo, uh, the, v, the VLANs inside of this the villains. <laughs> and this automatically. Yeah? So the fiber net is a two of LA network. It has a data plan. The data plan is a static VLANs, and the control plan uses VPLS. Here's the topology. You create a logical topology to connect all the island. And, uh, and create a topology is a, a cloud for the control plan. 
Federation Fiber was born federated because you are using my slice, that's SFA basis. All aggregate managed, you federate by fiber. And in terms of the authentication, you are using the CAFE, is the Shibolet Federation, Brazilian Shibolet Federation, and LDAP. Authorization, you are definition in the phase of definition the access roads. Uh, the idea you have a PI that authorizes license account to, to create. So you are in this phase to definition. Authentication is through LDAP. You have a global director at NOCI that synchronizes with LDAP in the local island. So the, the idea that a user go to the, the island in your, at your university, ask for account, and have an administration that knows this user research. <coughs> And uh, with this account, the user can um, authentication in another island. And uh, RNP will be the, the catch-all island for the user that would have an island in your, at your university. Uh, you have a knock in Brazil. You are using Perf Sonar in each island to monitor the, the performance. And ZenOS to monitor of the faults. And we have a ticket system, local administration, operation distributed. So <laughs> it have an um, um, operation strategy to use the, the fiber. And uh, the idea that the experimenter is a workflow going to the portal. Oh, I'm sorry. Going to the, oh, go to the portal and the registration, make the reservation and uh, all this, the network, the, the establish uh, this, the, the network for the experiment and have a sense of the VM, use the console and create your experiment. Uh, in, in to the project, you create some pilots to, to show the, validate the test bed. You have on pilot that use uh, um, a control uh, train that's <laughs> inside a laboratory. And uh, from the controllers, the OMF, you can control this train. It's a mobility test. Another is use high quality video transmission and transmission from Brazil and from UK. And uh, you can change uh, which server I use are connected by uh, uh, create some automatically handle. Uh, his idea, the <clears throat> imagine a, a user want to, to watch a football game in Brazil. Next, next month you have some videos. <laughs> and uh, the idea that send the parameter, selects the, the source, and automatically create a network path to, trans to make the stream of this video. And so, it's a, a, another pilot is, is about the open flow GMAP, GMAPLS band on, on demand that integrates the, the optical and the Ethernet technology and the user GMPLS. And uh, another pilot, it uses the, the, the test bed to create IP network and they use the route flow, that's application that creates an IP network on top of that. Uh, final consideration. Okay. Um, for the European partners, uh, well, fiber is, has been immensely useful for uh, both sides. For the European partners, uh, have some extension in your project. Develop, you, 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 you have to develop some features in your failure and the MF. You test many. You have a lot of people test this application, and so you have some sharing uh, knowledge. Uh, from the Brazilian part, the collaboration with the European experimental group was fantastic, and uh, it speed our learning curve. And uh, for both sites, you have some global collaboration now, instigated by Gini Project in the United States. And we are working in the idea of the clo global federation and uh, the contest. 
Fiber is a showcase project. It demonstrates the local capacity collaboration with European projects and Brazil. It's very important to work. It's not easy to work together. It's a lot of people work together, <laughs> a lot of institution, and put all people on the same page <laughs> is a challenge, but uh, you, you, you prove that it's, pos it's possible. And uh, beyond fiber, you have some uh, structure of the federation. You have a connection, 10 institutions in Brazil, plus three in Europe. Fiber is, is done. Uh, the next steps is sustainability, operation, management, finance, policy, federation with other tests ready. And I think that's very similar to what Emirates is doing. And uh, you are trying to convince our sponsor that the test badge as a service is important to have this service at Emirates. Because after the project, what you're doing with a lot of the infrastructure deploying is, is you need the sustainability. So I think that your range is academic network is provides this kind of service to research because the network is the subject of the research for us. So I think that's that's bad as a service. He is the team in Brazilian side, and a lot of students and a lot of research. And uh, it's a timeline uh, where you are. You are here and finish the project. Uh, you have a, a third fiber uh, workshop in Brazil, in Florianópolis. You start the project here in Pozna, you kick off. And you have some meeting in Brazil and Europe. And how you have the final review <laughs> and uh, finish. And you have a booth at Terena, and I invite offers to go to find to see this explanation. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for your talk. Uh, Testbed as a service is a key. Also in Europe here, we have a lot of activities around this, also in Gent. Uh, this yeah. is a keyword we are deeply investigating. Uh, are there any questions to the speaker? from the audience. Thanks. When you slice the infrastructure, how well protected are the resources from network all the way up? Yeah, good question. <laughs> yeah, let me show the, this picture here. Yeah, because here, at, uh, yeah, uh, here you have a MFP, M, MFLS network uh, that you have Juniper here, MX. And the MX you have a system logical that can create some virtual routers. And I connected this, the, the open flow equipment in this uh, port and create a privacy network inside here. Um, yeah, it's not all separated, some, some components shared, I, as I know, and uh, you are testing this model, and uh, the idea that in future you have open, uh, open flow here, and you can separate in the way more Really, but it's uh, the first that that I try to do. Are there any other questions? If not, we go straightly to the okay. next speaker. Thank you very much, Yara, for your excellent talk. The next speaker, Noemi Rodriguez, is an associate professor at the Department of Computing Science in Catholic University of Rio de Janeiro, also Brazil. Her research and teaching focus on concurrency and distributed systems. The talk is on testbed for teaching and experimenting with wireless sensor networks. So hello, good morning. Um, I think it's nice that this talk is right after Yara's because uh, you see the topics are related. So 
I think this is more or less well known, but uh, it is hard to uh, work and to experiment with wireless sensor networks. Uh, you have, when you program them, there are a lot of difficulties, so there is a lot of research still going on on algorithms and programming models. Um, but it's very difficult to uh, experiment with them because uh, it's nice to have heterogeneous environments to, uh, to try our algorithm or system, but it's uh, very hard to have this heterogeneous environment at your own institution. So there are many researchers in Brazil who are working with this subject, but it's hard to have access to real infrastructures. So mostly they, uh, we've been working with simulation, but it's really interesting to see how you get different results. So we'll probably always need simulation because uh, you can get things done in a different scale. But when you have something working in the simulator and then you put it on the real network, it's many times you get surprises. So it, it's very important to have the real uh, wireless sensor network to experiment. And now we are with even more complex environments because uh, with the Internet of Things, you don't want only to uh, have to uh, collect things from the sensor network in a central point and then distribute them uh, through a portal, for instance, but you want to have the devices directly connected in your application. So uh, we think it's interesting to have a collaborative testbed and they will allow education and research to benefit from a pool of shared resources. Um, one thing that we think is very important also is uh, that is being talked about uh, in other talks here is the idea of reproducibility that you uh, as, as researchers, we always have this problem. You, I, ha I have a PhD student who uh, was working on wireless science, is working on this subject, and he tried to download some of the things that other groups had done and reproduce the experiments. And it's very, very hard because you don't have the same environment and you don't have the tools anymore. So we also think that the testbed is an opportunity for collaboration in this way, that you can uh, leave your experiment there and then come back and uh, other people can go there and do this same experiment again. Well, there are lots of test beds uh, going on as uh, being developed and we think it's an interesting uh, service, an important service for an NREN to uh, offer. I'm coming back to this at the end. So we are conducting a project which is funded by RNP. It involves several institutions, um, which I put the logos down there. So I'm from the Catholic University, but the coordinator for this project is from the Federal University at Rio de Janeiro. And there is another small group at the Federal University at Goiás. And RNP is funding the project. So what is the idea? We, we uh, intend to have this platform with 35 mica z, I don't know how you say that, uh, <laughs> and 10 Telus B nodes. Uh, we, at the moment, we have some mica z and Telus B, and uh, we, we have just received the, the, uh, some Arduinos and Raspberry uh, P nodes, so now we are going to extend the network. And uh, we intend to uh, support, we are supporting hybrid applications running IP6. And we also intend to offer different abstraction levels for uh, programmers so that you can uh, use the portal for teaching and for researching at different levels, and also some learning materials. So what is the idea of the portal? You have a uh, wired infrastructure that allows the, here is the portal, and here you upload your program, and then you, you, it can distribute the program through this wired infrastructure. Here is where the Silex and the um, MIB, C, 
600 uh, boards come in because they interface the, the modes to the Ethernet. And then uh, at, this, at this point, you get the user connected through the uh, Internet. So uh, here at this portal, you have the uh, idea of reserving the a slice of time where you are going to run your experiment. And then you can uh, upload your code. Uh, there is a repository with codes that are already available. And also, uh, you can uh, configure your whole experiment, what nodes you want to be alive, what is the topology, when each node is going to come in, and so on. Uh, how does the user uh, monitor and uh, uh, see the results of the experiment? So uh, the flow of information that usually in a, one of these applications you have uh, a mode that is directly connected to the computer and this mode is called the base station. So in our infrastructure any of the nodes can uh, function as a base station, and so it will send uh, through a serial interface through the, uh, to this portal uh, computer, and we uh, directly re uh, bridge it over to, a, uh, to the computer, to the remote user, so it is as if it were the computer of the user was directly connected to the, uh, this mode, the base station. So, uh, this is, uh, it's nothing uh, so different, but we are uh, excited that we are beginning to have the first experiences with this portal. Uh, we, uh, the, again, in all the, in this morning, uh, in the talks, they were uh, emphasizing the importance of the hands-on experience. So we see that for the students, it's uh, very different to work with a simulator and work with this kind of infrastructure. I am teaching a course on distributed systems and uh, over the last few years I have started teaching a, a three week module which uses wireless sensor networks and th this time right at the moment I'm, I am teaching at the moment I'm here but I'm, I've been teaching the, for the last weeks about the modes and now they are using this infrastructure. I am at the Catholic University, and the, uh, the testbed itself is at the Federal University. So, and uh, I think we, we still have to uh, go a little further because I think we should have cameras, which we don't have yet, showing the modes themselves so that the, it could be, uh, have a more real feeling. But uh, it's nice to see how the students react to knowing, to seeing the application running on a, a bunch of uh, real nodes. So uh, we have some uh, facilities for programming. As, as I said before, you can upload your code to this portal and then it's distributed via the wired network and uh, that you can use IP version 6. So th there are already some uh, small experiments uh, with IP uh, version 6, and this also uses this structure, the same structure I mentioned before, that the portal computer acts as a repetition. Uh, in this case, you can use an address, uh, a version 4 address, to reach this portal, and then it will uh, route the, uh, the messages to the node modes themselves, but now you can address specific modes in this network. And uh, so my, in my case, I'm very interested in programming at higher levels of abstraction, so this is what we also intend to offer in this testbed. Uh, the traditional way of programming is either is with systems uh, which are relatively low level, such as Contiki and TinyOS. We've been using TinyOS for our development, but we um, are developing this system called Terra, uh, which means Earth in Portuguese, and that's why the uh, the testbed's name now is Céu na Terra, which means Heaven in Earth. Uh, and 
Cell uh, is the name of the scripting language we use to develop in this system we are working on. So what is this uh, system? Uh, what Terra offers is a virtual machine with uh, some ready-made components for common tasks. And when you are using it for teaching, you can take in or put in, you can configure the virtual machine so as to have higher or lower levels of ready-made components. And then so you can have, for instance, uh, uh, only the base components which uh, interact with the sensors and the timers and with uh, a very basic send and receive operation, or you can have higher level operations like collecting data in a group of neighbors. And over these ready-made components, we use this scripting language called Cell. So this is more or less uh, the idea of the system. There is the, the script program, in fact, goes through a compiler and has several uh, safety checks. So our chair mentioned that I'm working with uh, concurrency and that's where my also another interest comes in because this safety checking has to do with uh, concurrency checks that uh, we uh, guarantee that some uh, bad things will not happen in your script and then uh, it is compiled to a bytecode and, and this bytecode in fact can be sent uh, remotely over the radio to the uh, modes if they are already uh, with the virtual machine installed. So this is uh, just to give you an idea. Uh, this uh, this uh, cell language, it is based on a reactive programming paradigm it is, so it, it tries to uh, offer the programmer a more sequential point of view in, when you, instead of the split phase, which is, I don't know if any of you are familiar with, but the uh, classic programming in TinyOS is all event driven. And here you emit a request and immediately you program the await for the answer so you have a more sequential uh, form of programming and there are some constructs like a parallel end so this construct will only terminate when both arms terminate and other programming facilities. This is to, to uh, illustrate what I mentioned about higher level abstractions. So in this case I have a, an operation ready made for sending to a group. We define a group and you can send to this whole group. So the idea in this system would be you can uh, create a virtual machine with this kind of abstraction or without it and then I can not only uh, use it for teaching as I am doing now with this very, um, more basic set of components but also for research because uh, some of our students also are using it to develop new protocols and then you don't want these ready-made components. You can use the, this to... Uh, to test the new grouping protocols or new routing protocols. So uh, we are not uh, yet federated, but we are working on this right now. Uh, to, to put this, uh, it, it is a web uh, service, so it's not a web, a web page where you go into the portal, so it won't be difficult to put it uh, on CAFE, the, the Brazilian Federation that Yara mentioned. And we are developing some videos and learning materials. Um, I'm sorry, I forgot to put the address of the portal here, but I, uh, I can please write to me if you uh, want to have a look at it. And the idea is that we uh, want to have emphasis on this reproducibility uh, stuff. So uh, one of the things that we want to investigate is, is we can use some of the uh, mechanisms that are used in the uh, network infrastructure testbed. For instance, there are some languages for describing the resources that you want to reserve. Maybe we could reuse the same description here and so as to, in the future, integrate uh, portals and then you could experiment with the both the network to, uh, technology and 
the fact that you, in the network you also have these uh, tiny devices. Well, and uh, the final remarks, when, so uh, going back to what I mentioned that uh, I was uh, going to come back to this thing of the service and at the moment uh, the, we are under a, a funding uh, mechanism. Uh, there are other people here who, from RNP who can talk more about it, but it's uh, called a, a working group uh, program and it's aimed at allowing the, at supporting uh, academic uh, researchers to develop uh, prototypes that can become services to be offered by the NREN to the community. And this is uh, the way that we are working under this program. So uh, one question is, what would be the, exactly the service that uh, would come out of this? So at, at the moment, we are hosting this uh, testbed uh, at the Federal University. But where would it be if it was offered as a service by the uh, NREN? And what model would we use for maintaining it? Because uh, this kind of uh, testbed, it's interesting that you can always put new devices in the, te uh, as you know, oh, now I have Arduinos and now I have the wash mode and I want this and that. And maybe it is difficult as a, if you look at it as a regular service to have all this activity going on. So maybe we need to think of uh, a financing model which is more distributed that you could also here federate resources from different universities, but uh, have the NREN as a coordinator, as an entry point, and, uh, have, and have also a financing program for uh, sometimes updating uh, this uh, service. But, well, I don't know. I think this is a question that we have to answer in the future, <laughs> not so far away future. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, are there any questions in the audience to the speaker, to Noemi? Okay, uh, I have one. Uh, have you already uh, have you already started the building the community around the products you, you are offering? So is it just for internal use at the moment of the organizations you mentioned as a key partner of the project? Or have you opened this to a wider Community. Uh, we are, have just started to open, but uh, it's only now that uh, there was a, a Brazilian uh, conference on networks just two weeks ago, and now we have the first contacts that we announced this project there. And so now I have two people who are interested, but this is going to happen in the next weeks. I can't tell you about that yet. Okay. okay. Thank you. It <laughs> Thank sounds you. promising. Thank you very much. <laughs> Okay, and now we go straight to the last speaker in the session, uh, David. David Salmon, uh, he works in Janet, uh, work with academic and research colleagues to understand activities, research activities and implications for the Janet, design of the Janet testing facility. So we'll hear today about Janet Aurora and evolution uh, to a national wide dark fiber facility. So David, floor is yours. Um, I'm out of life now. Yeah, yeah let's see, yes, I can hear that now. Thank you, Bartosz. Um, right, I want, to, um, <clears throat> I want to describe a little bit about how we've come to be where we, where we are with this facility now. So I'm going to um, touch on the history of this a little bit um, because it bears on things that have happened recently which fortunately lead to the success that I alluded to in the final point there. But on the route through this, I want to cover some of the important research results at a high level. I'm not going to go into them in huge depth um, because they've been pretty key in persuading the um, funding bodies that it was worthwhile to, uh, to pursue this. And we've had struggles along the way, which I'll describe a little bit about. So establishing the facility, the early years of Aurora. Um, the roots of this really go back to the early 2000s when within, um, certainly within the UK, there was a, 
an e-science funding program around, um, doing a lot of work on grid systems, getting the communities lined up behind that, things like Globus, etc. But within that, there was a, ne a network development strand had been proposed. Um, the various X-Lite facilities were very current at the time, Starlight, Netherlight in the Vanguard, uh, a little bit later UK Light came along. Um, we did pursue that, but within that networking program, it had always been foreseen that there should be access for some dark fibre for the network researchers really to get down to the foundation level and, and, and do their research. And there were various bits of bureaucracy, committees, etc., that funded and approved all of these things. So talk went on, as did the years. So in 2003 to 2005, we, we within Janet, implemented our first Layer 2 point-to-point -point service called UK Light, based on Ethernet over SDH at that time, but <coughs> no effort, no funding, or no approval to spend on the dark fibre research side of things. So finally in 2006, after lobbying within the research communities, um, the appropriate committee said, <coughs> yes, get, get, get on with this now, and you can start thinking about spending the money. So we did that. We, uh, we went out to a procurement, fibre procurement, interesting procurement in the sense that we, uh, we requested fibres with particular characteristics, fairly normal, that the research communities had asked us to do, and none of the bidders came back with any fibre specs. So we spent a long time after selecting a preferred supplier where they went out and did testing and characterisation before uh, we were persuaded that they could actually deliver what they had promised. Now it's interesting because that world has changed a lot now. We don't hit that problem anymore. Um, so 2007, there was a lot of testing, route selection to make sure we could get to the right places. Um, finally signed a contract in June and we put a network in place or put a design in place to link the Universities of Essex, Cambridge and University College in London. Um, finally accepted that infrastructure in late 2007. So you can see we're already sort of maybe six years down the line from the first discussions. So not a quick process this. 2008, the researchers start putting their equipment on it, um, but there's a bit of a problem there in the sense that we had money to put the fibre infrastructure in, but the researchers had access to no budgets to support projects. So they basically put in what they'd got to hand in the labs, funded from other projects, and really did things on a, on a best efforts basis. And it's an important point, and I'll revisit that in a, in a few slides' time. Um, and at the same time, there was more money available for fibre, but not for projects. So we added another two universities at Aston and Southampton. So the network grew to around 800 kilometres at that time. Um, unfortunately, um, 2009 onwards, the, um, the researchers were actually beginning to get some good, good science results as well. <clears throat> Those were beginning to get noticed. And in the background, the political lobbying had begun with our, within one of our research councils to get them to notice this and to plan to provide some exploitation funding so that projects could be funded to do work over the facility. Um, they were successful in that. The requirement for the facility was noted, but the council wasn't prepared to fund the infrastructure. It would fund projects, but not the fibres. So we've got a bit of a, a, bit of a seesaw going on here. So I'm, going to, uh, I'm just going to move on to some of the research results now, but that's a snapshot of what the network looked like at that point with the five universities, Aston, Cambridge, Essex, UCL and Southampton connected via the, te the, the facility in London which links them all together and then uh, connections onwards within Janet within the UK to layer two services and then in principle also onwards to Europe and beyond um, via Gel. So a quick whiz across some of the research results that were achieved in that early period now. The first one of which is um, a, a result on optical time division multiplexing. Um, if we start down here, there are three wavelengths, the ones that are coloured there, and they're coming in, they're quite special rates, not conventional telecoms wavelengths at 43 gigabit per second each. But nevertheless, three coming in down this fibre on separate waves. And the bit of magic that they wove here was to, in all optical processing, was to retime and reshape those signals to put them into a, 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 an optical time division multiplexing signal so that the, the, the encoded information is coming in time slots. Propagate that across the network, 
unpick what was just done and put it back into a normal conventional uh, WDM domain. And actually there were two nodes um, on this. You'll see there's a diagram here which shows this part of the network which was taking place over Janet Aurora, but there were other bits going on within BT's fibre network, and BT were collaborators in this experiment. So it's an early example of one of the, uh, what I call a capability technique being demonstrated. It's probably not the kind of thing we're expecting to see in a, in a commercial networking product yet, but it's demonstrating the, the ability to actually um, work with equipment at this kind of level and techniques. So moving on, there's a, another result that was obtained on um, uh, rege all optical regeneration of a particular modulation scheme, differential phase shift keying, using a special kind of amplifier. Um, essentially what was done here, uh, you'll note there's, uh, there's a model of uh, taking a signal, multiple wavelength signal, standard transmission system, long distance over a network, unpicking some of those wavelengths all optically regenerating them, shifting the wavelengths, punting it back on and then detecting it and demonstrating that as a, another capability feature. So within the Aurora network, this was done between Southampton and London and you see the distances there told up to 200 kilometres and if you course you go there and back then you get to the 400 kilometres which is here. So this was with, um, it wasn't with any, any other partners, they were simply turning the signals around in London uh, and using it as a long network to do the trials. Um, same diagram again essentially um, over the top of that network. And this shows the results that were obtained. Um, essentially they're demonstrating in the classic way that um, they can detect the signals, regenerate them. The eye diagrams are, key, uh, are, are, um, are clean. And the difference between regenerating the signal and not regenerating the signal gives you either a, um, a signal-to-noise advantage at a given power level or enables you to drop the power and keep the, the, the bit rate the same. So again, another demonstration of techniques. Most of the results that I've highlighted here actually got high prominence in the sort of international uh, photonics conferences, so they are seen as significant and were, were at the time. The final point I want to cover here at this point in the, in, in, in the talk is a discussion of uh, quite, quite a different nature. Um, the National Physical Laboratory is the UK's National Metrology Laboratory, um, looking at time, frequency, mass, etc., temperature. And there's a lot of interest at the moment in um, taking time standards beyond the current position of based on microwaves and cesium, cesium the national, national atomic clocks, because there's a potential to gain maybe five orders of magnitude in precision on uh, clocks based on optical techniques. But as part of the program of work that they're undertaking, um, there, are, there are quite a lot of different avenues to, to approaching these. It's not yet clear which ones are best. Not everybody can afford to do all of them. So if each lab specialises a little bit, there's an interesting question about how you compare a clock at one lab with a clock at another lab to see who's doing better. Um, so they've been interested for a long time in trying to propagate time and frequency references over optical fibres in a way which would enable a meaningful comparison of the clocks between labs. And this diagram represents some of the early work that was done by a student of the uh, staff member at the National Physical Laboratory in the UK working at the University of Southampton on the PhD using things called optical frequency control, uh, combs which have got very precise spacing and which can be tied to a, 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 a clock, clock reference. The aim was to send these combs, which are broadband, out over the network and bring them back and then compare the re received signal with the sent signal to measure the drift rate. Um, and as long as the servo mechanism here is, is able to respond quickly enough, then there's a fibre structure there which can compensate it. So the result was they demonstrated that within a certain tolerance level it was indeed possible to propagate the time or frequency reference, the frequency reference from this location to that location. And this is foundation work and there's a lot of interest in these <coughs> techniques across the world. I think at the time this was done that was sort of a world best result for, for a given distance. Now things have moved on since then. And there's a significant amount of interest now. I think that there's one of the, the current projects made a bid to use some of the spare fibres on uh, Angers as part of the recent open call. Um, so, some success there as well. Um, 
we've got a group at the University College London. They're important for, for Aurora and as a sort of an academic, academic lead on, on the research front that are broadly interested in, in coherent techniques um, for recovering signals across networks, simply because you can then inject it and re-extract or the amplitude or the phase um, modulation scheme that was originally applied. Now they've got, they've got a particular approach based on a particular kind of phase lock loop, which gives them the precision um, and enables them to have master clocks which, or master lasers which then control rather cheaper and stabilise rather cheaper um, uh, laser, laser sources so that they're, they're, they're sort of looking to um, devices that, that would perform better but more cheaply in, in future optical networking devices. So again, it's another demonstration of capability here effectively within a, an oops, with an intensity modulated scheme, they're again demonstrating that their particular approach has got an advantage using coherent tape detection over direct detection. So this is an important facility because uh, the, the grant holders have got about six million pounds to do terabit uh, investigations over dark fiber. So they're one of the big drivers for the kind of um, optical fiber development facility that we're describing here. Um, picture of their lab facilities. It's a mixture of internal fiber spools with the ability to, um, to send signals out over the uh, wide area network to do field trials and they've got a variety of uh, specific uh, areas of investigation within their program there. So, so some of the earlier results. I'm going to move back now to the sort of politicking and evolution aspect of the network where we're really battling to try and sustain the facility in some sense. Our initial funding window expired in around 2010-11 as the e-science program closed and was reviewed. We fought a little bit for an extra year's money from one of our funders, now, now part of, well we're all part of one organisation, just Janet now. Uh, we got that money, but not enough, so we had to drop part of the network off again. So we're ebbing and flowing a bit here. Um, but in late 2011, covering this period, there was a big windfall in the community, maybe 150, 160 million pounds from UK government through this particular department. Um, and 26 million of that came to Janet at the time when our preparations for our new network were well underway. Now, my colleague Rob Evans reported on this yesterday, so I'm not going to say anything about that aspect. But it did enable us to park £2 million of that against keeping the fibre facility going in future. And at the same time, the lobbying within the funding bodies to get project money released to do work over the fibres finally begins to... Uh, begins to bear fruit. The problem had been that the Research Council was very unwilling to commit money for exploitation with a very short window or, or maybe only one or perhaps two years certainty over the future of the fibre infrastructure. So when they saw that Janet had got this and with a view to providing a five-year forward look service, that unstuck the Research Council money. So at last things are beginning to, to move in the right direction. Um, so they go through their normal access pr procurement procedures, they launched a, a tender process inviting open bids to come and provide them with a fibre facility. Um, and in January last year, um, my academic colleagues and myself within Janet backed a bid, which we eventually won in May last year. So a long last, we've got a bit of stability coming here. Um, doesn't completely get us out of the woods. Um, we run a procurement. We couldn't start that procurement until we knew who'd won the Research Council bid because we didn't know which sites would be involved. So who, we knew who the strong contenders were, but we couldn't just renew the old contract. So that, that held us up for a while. As soon as that certainty came in, we did all the normal procurement exercises. Um, the outcome was a new supplier come in, so we've got to completely rebuild the network. We thought at one point that the incumbent supplier would give a good bid, but they, they didn't give one that was as competitive as their, com as, uh, as their competitors. So 
there we are, we've got a completely new infrastructure, so we've got to do all the planning for that. So where we are at the moment, deployment continues. We are aiming, and I think this is a pretty, pretty reasonable chance that we will have everything in place again for July this year. Now, the old contracts expired in October last year, so we've essentially been running for 10 months now. With, with, there has been no fibre facility in the UK. Um, but the carrot is that at long last, from the middle of this year, we've got five years stability, we've got the infrastructure funded, and we've got exploitation funding lined up. So miraculously, we are now in the best place we have ever been on this, maybe 12 years after the discussion started, something like that. It's a long time. So when the network died, that's what it looked like. You can see that, um, that Aston has disappeared. We couldn't afford that. The other complication was that you'll... Professor Simeonidou at Essex left and moved to Bristol and took her whole team with it. So we've got a university that's connected, but with nobody to use it, and we've got a big group over here that aren't connected. <laughs> so we've had quite a lot of uh, interesting um, complications on this project. So that was the snapshot at the time. So just two or three more of the research results and then a forward look on the infrastructure. Um, I'm not going to go into all of the detail on this, partly because I don't understand it all myself, but effectively it's another one of these important post-deadline papers at the um, European Conference on early demonstration of gridless networking. Now, I think there's a talk on flex grids tomorrow at some point. I should be interested to see that. Um, you'll note again that it's the part of the Aurora network, but also a big part of BT's network, and essentially what people are doing here is taking a mix of, let's say, legacy 10 gig level services, a mixture of some more, more um, current 40 gig and 100 gig coherent, and then a really interesting beast here, a very experimental 550 gig service implemented over 640 gigs worth of spectrum. So a really fat spectrum slice carrying a lot of traffic. Um, and, and an infrastructure predicated on being able to work with that kind of mix of signals. And if you look at some of the functional components down inside, these are optical, flex grid optical cross connects. The kind of functions here look a spectrum slice switch and standard demuxes, but also some things for managing fragmentation on spectrum, much as you get optical blocking in the DWDM world you get it worse if you've got a big splice of spectrum allocated to a service and need to move it somewhere to try and, um, try and keep coherence. So there was very successful um, work done there. Um, I put this one in because it's going to build. There's a component here which is designed to do sort of format agnostic wavelength conversion. It doesn't matter on the modulation scheme, polarization, within some constraints, it can perform that function. So they had a trial, again, it's one of these loopback experiments where you've got signal sources driving out over the network, bringing the signal back in again, wavelength converting, sending back out and again um, with a, a loop length of 600 kilometres and some results using um, a couple of different modulation schemes, binary phase shift, quad phase shift, 10 gig, 20 gig services, Constellations showing that perhaps with the exception on here where they're getting a little bit close that actually you've got clean reconstruction of the received signals. Um, this is on injection into the network. This is after wavelength conversion and that's after the full 1,200 kilometres. So again, another example of capability of what, what people are learning how to, to manipulate these signals in a constructive way. And I think the final example now of um, yet another degree of freedom in this world of space division multiplexing. So we've got a, a mess of stuff in here. Um, these nodes that are called AOD, that stands for Architecture on Demand. And my way of reading this is if you look at the content of it, there's a whole bunch of different techniques, either just fixed switching, flex grid switching, space division switching. Um, what, we, what, what that means in this context, if you note these two things in here called MCFs, these are multi-core fibres where you can, I think in this case, seven cores rather than the standard single core in most fibres, is that they've got switching techniques which can manipulate which of those cores a given signal goes down and then unpick that at the far end. And you've got this <coughs> mega beast in the middle that can do all the smart stuff. 
um, again, it's the success on showing the capability on this kind of infrastructure was another one of the post-deadline presentations. You might notice that the University of Bristol's involved in this, yet they're no longer collect collected. But actually, Southampton was hosting their equipment for them by that time, just so that they can keep up their research program while we were working on getting the new infrastructure in place. Um, I think that's essentially saying the same thing in, in a different diagram. I'm not going to get into all of that, in part because I don't understand it. But with the one exception that this functional block here, which is now embedded in part of that, is the wavelength converter that was tested in the previous set of work. So what you're seeing is compounding of these equipment techniques as they're being built up. So if you go all the way back to the first slide I showed, which was one on optical time division multiplexing, a single technique, success demonstrated, and what we've got here now is a huge, great mix of stuff going on. So really the whole environment has matured very significantly and there's enormous difference in the capability here. So again, another strong indication of the success that's been achieved over this infrastructure. So I'm going to shift now to say where do we go from this point. I said earlier that we're deploying... How much time have we got? So we've got a new network to put in place. What do we do? I've mentioned some of the problems. We had fibre but no money for equipment and exploitation. So this time around, given that we got everything agreed up front, what were we going to do with it? Now, it's not, not me or Janet doing this. This is actually the researchers deciding what kind of a facility is it that we want to be able to support our, our, our experiments. Um, with a couple of riders on the back that, of course, they've had to promise the research councils that they will deliver a service as part of winning the bid, which was for a national dark fibre infrastructure service. So there's some interesting tensions in all of this, which I think really bear on this notion of what is it to build a test bed? Does it provide services? If so, at what level? And what does it mean to federate these things? Because in my mind, none of this is at all clear. So... Uniform engineering, that's sensible, really. Um, flexible, remotely configurable, again, no-brainer. Very much sort of in inspired by these sort of SDN principles. Pull it all in place, make it as flexible as we can get away with, and make sure we can control it all remotely. Um, sensible, coherent management across the network. It may sound trivial, but in the early version of the network, we couldn't even get the DSL working correctly to some of those remote nodes due to equipment incompatibilities, software problems hardware issues, it, it took 18 months in some cases just to get a DSL circuit working. It's just unbelievably bad. Um, but there is this notion that we're in, in some sense the infrastructure has to deliver services to other users or projects. Now, I've put services in inverted commas there because I view this network as a bag of components to be mixed and matched and assembled to support the kinds of work that the researchers want to do. And in some cases, that will mean they will have exclusive access to all or part of it. So service in that sense would mean scheduling. But that's why I said there's a lot of questions about what it really means to, to run a facility like that. The council wants to see services, and I think we can spin that in the right kind of way. It certainly wants to see it exploited by uh, other disciplines, users, projects. So I guess the steer there is that the researchers are going to have to do a lot of outreach to user communities to come in and say, hey, come on, give us some applications that might illustrate the capability that we're demonstrating in this um, optical infrastructure. Um, so this is really this problem of, you know, test bed as a service, tension between that and doing the pure R&D. Um, we also, I, I mentioned early on that Janet started doing Layer 2 services through UK Light. These days we do it with Ethernet over MPLS, but nevertheless... It was an important part in selling the concept to the research councils that although the fibre footprint was limited in scope and essentially all in the south of England, that either by co-location at one of the directly connected sites or by our access over the normal production network that other researchers around the country would be able to get access to it and, and do their work. So this notion of they have two services, either as light paths with a capacity commitment or just a standard logical separation through a VPN was quite important. So this is the shape of the new network, uh, very similar to the old one with one or two changes. So we're having Bristol over here instead of Essex, which was over there. Cambridge stays on. We've got London and Southampton still. 
And just because of the way the fibres are rooted this time, we actually have an interesting sort of spread down in the south where we've got two fibres running in parallel. Um, these colo sites are where the intermediate amplification uh, systems are put in. Um, purely by chance, I happened to be in London at about the right time when the new infrastructure was going in at University College. So I saw our suppliers, a company called SSET, who had just finished digging the trenches and putting the new fibre in there. This location is the normal telecoms facility for the university, um, and the actual lab's about 500 metres south of there, where Alwyn Seeds and his terahertz test bed sit. So this is a representation of what uh, the new nodes in Aurora are likely to look. Uh, uh, curious, I didn't draw this and it's sort of upside down to my mind because if you view the fibre at the top then you, you sort of go up the network and start by coming down. But we've got optical amps, tunable dispersion compensation, fibre switches, lens devices, and then access to these net FPGAs, programmable um, devices which people can exploit for the R&D. Uh, layer 2 switches, control, read that as open flow, server, and standard uh, networking uh, and a, a similar but not identical uh, configuration at the intermediate sites. These are the, the, the bigger um, interconnect points where there'll be a larger switch. And this is a, a drawing the right way around to my mind with the, the fibres down here. We've got here a Pilates fibre switch. Now the Bristol team have already demonstrated a and S being able to control these fibre switches using SDN type approaches. Um, I'm not aware of the specific details of the technology that's yet to come, but essentially that the, the patching can be done remotely as required. Um, we've got the layer two switches and the net FPGAs. All of this is standard management stuff. Fibre signals are here. These are the interesting connections about how you mix <coughs> and match the equipment at the nodes to build the specific set of uh, interconnections that, that are needed to support the, uh, the project at hand. So a colleague, Martin Feist at UCL, put together a set of slides which was really helpful in, um, in um, determining how many ports we needed on the optical switch and, and persuading his academic colleagues about this. So this is uh, a representation of an 8x8 optical switch with um, fibres coming in and out east, in and out west, um, amplifiers, dispersion compensators, and the higher level, the net FPGA and the layer 2 switch. So at the moment, nothing's connected. This is a straight through, so you patch the, patch the fibres straight through, nothing happens, the thing's neutral. Um, this, if you follow it through, takes you through an amplifier and back out, so that can be configured in that way. There's complete symmetry, top and bottom. This time round, two-stage amplifier, once as a preamp, back round again, dispersion compensation, second stage of amplification, back out, all remotely reconfigurable. Um, this is just straight loop back in east, out west, there you go, both ways, on its way, <laughs> turn them around. And this time loop back with an amplifier. Um, I put those in because I thought it's quite a nice illustration of what the power of that fibre switch or the port switch is at the bottom of that stack there in terms of remote configurability and mixing and matching the equipment. So the first speaker this afternoon mentioned Bristol. This is inside the High Performance uh, Networks Group's lab in Bristol. This is an enormous Pilates switch, 192 ports on that. That's way beyond anything we're ever going to put out on Aurora. Um, and this is, I think, is one of their SDN stroke optical bays. It's, it's a, an interesting lab that's got about eight stations on it, and this is just one of them. And they can fully interconnect. I think it, uh, it took not far over half a million pounds just to put all of the trays in the roof and get all the cabling in there. That was the big win that Demetra got when she moved from, um, from Essex to Bristol that they kitted out this lab new for her. So this is a complete interlude now, given all of this heavy technical stuff. This is the end of Demetra's lab in, in Bristol. You can see it's a funny shape because it sits in a triangle between two roads. I've called it Nipper. Because if you look there, there's a little dog up on the top. There's a close-up of it. I took these photos a few weeks ago when I visited. Nipper the dog. I don't know if people were reminded of anything. His master's voice. 
It turned out that the, the guy who owned the dog worked in that building, and there's a little blue memorial plaque there about, uh, about it there. So there's a bit of, uh, bit of connection to the performing world, which I think when Demetra gets around to um, doing some of our high-rate media um, applications as drivers for the kind of network technologies that we're talking about here, this will really be particular apt. But uh, I was quite amused by this when I, when I saw it. I thought it was worth putting in. Right, um, that's the UK position, but of course we've had presenters from Brazil this morning where the whole world's interested in all of this kind of stuff. So how does the UK infrastructure fit more broadly into what's going on both within the UK and Europe? Now I mentioned earlier that our National Physical Laboratory and, and their peers across Europe and the rest of the world are all interested in these um, exotic, um, non-conventional telecoms use of fibres. Well, the National Physical Laboratory has also got a budget and has put fibres in between its lab in south-west London to both of the Tele housing facilities, Tele House and Tele City in London. It has also put it back into the Harwell Oxford campus and uh, there's a specialist unit there funded by the UK government looking at satellite applications. They're going to be sending some of their time reference signals to this site so that they can be go up from the satellite ground station up to the constellation where they'll be doing some interesting things in a project called ACES. This Harwell Oxford campus happens to be where Janet's main office is. I sit about 300 metres away from this place. More interestingly still is that there are two or three locations where their fibres intersect with the Aurora fibres. So we're going to be actively discussing what might meaningfully be done to collaborate. This happens to be Newbury and Tullyson then onwards into Europe. So actually now we've got, we've got Aurora, we've got NPL, we've got BT have got stuff, and the radio astronomers further north have actually got something which is special, but who knows, who knows. So, very rich mix at the moment. Um, and as I wrap up on this, I just want to broaden it out slightly. We heard of, uh, about SDNs um, and I, this morning. I think we're going to hear more in some of the other parallel strands. It's a strong theme at the conference. At the moment, a lot of it does translate to open flow. Um, there is a desire within the research communities to collaborate, and Janet's involved in a broader discussions within the UK where we found perhaps 10 universities that are interested in layer two type collaborations with interesting infrastructures. So Janet is at the moment looking at a modest, we are not going to put in a large number of nodes in on the network and we're not going to be spending a lot of money, but just something to get things moving a bit. Um, in part, that's why I've asked the question of the earlier speaker about what it means to slice these infrastructures, because I have no idea yet how we're going to run this. I don't know what's going to happen with it. A lot of open questions. It would be ideal if we could split it three ways and share it between three projects and have them not interfere with each other. That's sort of a utopian goal, but I'm interested to know how close we can get to that. Um, also, again, Bristol, Edinburgh, Lancaster, enormous great funding injection from the research councils, half from research council, half from industry and kind, five-year programme grant. Program grant's an important word in UK funding because it means that the academics get control of the money, but they don't have to spend it immediately. They can, they can disperse it and decide later how they use it. So there's a lot of power to shape a program over five years. And that's to do with all layers, photonic, layer two, even access, wireless. And I put some question marks there because the Edinburgh group has got a guy called Harold Haas who's doing work on Li-Fi, uh, Wi-Fi but over light in context there. So there's all sorts of stuff in this mix. And a, another range of smaller individual projects which some of these 10 universities are, are, are involved in. So although it may not take exactly this shape, I think we might have four nodes rather than three, we can take the fibre infrastructure I've just described with its general node design. We're going to be looking at a layer two overlay, but for research with SDN type capabilities built with the normal Janet services and then see what happens. So, to wrap up, the big win is that we've got stable five years funding. We want, we have, and we will build more strong collaborations, and we want to work not just within the com country, but internationally as well. Um, there's going to be some governance on this from the uh, academic community, particularly in light of, of trying to encourage the, the broader community to use some of this, the applications projects, if you like. 
um, and Janet's involved in the consortium for management purposes. Um, so there's a really good track record of, of high profile previous results, some of which I've highlighted. Um, so where does this success come from? Well, I think we've ground away persistence. It's really paid off. The good results have certainly helped. And I think combining the persistence so we were sort of ready when the good fortune came along and we were able to capitalise on it has at last got us to where we really want to be, this timely convergence of the two funding streams which made it happen. So we've got a very good team with the academics, infrastructure support from Janet, and as a final slide, I'd just like to acknowledge our funders, just Janet, Biz, EPSRC, and all of the academics in the various research groups at these organisations, and indeed their colleagues who are not named. Who are, Janet doesn't do the research, but we're supporting it, and it's these people who have done all those results that I, I showed earlier. Right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for this exciting talk. Uh, so there is a strong team behind Janet doing actual research. This is a very well, we're supporting the academics, you know, we don't do the research ourselves. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah, uh, and thank you for sharing lessons learned <laughs> from the past uh, while building this infrastructure. I found it really useful. Uh, any questions? Oh, yeah. Hi, David Wild from Arnett. Thanks, that was uh, really interesting. Um, is any of the work that, that is coming out of the, these testbed experiments and so on, because it's, it's really interesting and unusual stuff, is any of that appearing to Janet as being usable on your own network to, to roll into your production network? I, I think it's way too early for right. that. The, the reason I use the word capability when I described the stuff earlier is because what, what needs to happen now is that vendors will do their business models, they'll look at the state of the technology, they'll pick up the interesting facets of what that comes out of academic research and they'll build that in. So my guess is we're at least five, if not ten years away from some of this before, you know, J Janet has to build, has to use, you know, good, high quality, mainstream commercial devices. The good thing is that we get a really interesting heads up on order a decade plus on where things are going. And actually, I think on some areas, the, the work with the transfer of the optical frequency cones, that's moved on. And there's a really interesting variant of that which restricts the spectrum instead of splatting a whole fibre. You keep it within one wavelength, so 50 or 100 uh, gigahertz. And that's got a really interesting potential for being a, a, a genuine service that could be carried across conventional telecoms infrastructures like most of the NRINs operate, and can keep it away from other things without disruption. But to some of the national labs, having a, having a reference tied direct to our own national lab could be very interesting. Links, very important links to things that are going on within the SKA, the uh, telescope about signal and timing there. OK, there, is, there are other questions, are there? Hi, uh, Simeon from Sandrine down in South Africa. Um, I have a question about the, it, it seems obvious to me that uh, there's some great benefits to have dark fiber for experimentation and research beyond the lab. Uh, my question is, to what extent, in your opinion, um, is that got to do with having a, a fiber network which is real, it's, it's out in the field in the environment and exposed to whatever factors um, you, you cannot easily recreate in the, in the lab versus um, being able to have different researchers, different labs collaborating on, on a single fiber network? My gut feeling is it's more the latter than the former um, because people like to use their labs. And although I said earlier that we, we, we explicitly allow for the possibility for people to come in and co-locate kit at the locations which are directly connected, in fact, that's always going to be a barrier, so it depends on how motivated they are. So I think the strength is probably the dominant access is the one about collaboration from where people already are. Bristol have a really interesting case because they're working on a citywide fibre with the local council, so it's like a microcosm of what I just described. However, we do have cases in point where when the research group was at Essex, they used to do some of their work at night because it was sensitive to vibration and they could tell that there was a difference in results from 
day to night. So you do get those environmental factors coming in. I guess with regard to sort of future products, of course, then um, you know, I suppose the first step is to detect that you're sen sensitive to them. The second one is to make sure it doesn't matter, I guess, because nobody's going to buy into that kind of technology unless it's very robust. So um, I think, yeah, as I said, the dominant one is more about collaboration, actually. Um, but it builds interesting things. Thank you very much. Uh, so there is time for a last question, maybe also to other speakers to conclude. If not, I would like to close the session. Thank you very much. Thank you to all speakers for the excellent work. Thank you. Thank you.